Hello, good evening and welcome to a special edition of Look East. On the day when many of you have been sharing your memories of the Duke of Edinburgh, who's died today at the age of 99. Long associated with the Youth Award scheme that bore his name, the Prince was patron of numerous charities. Tonight, we'll be remembering the Duke, paying tribute to his work and hearing your stories. But we start at Ely Cathedral and our reporter, Sam Reid. Mo, so many of the tributes to the Duke of Edinburgh today have understandably focused on his national, international role on the global stage. But what's clear from talking to people here today is the big local impact he also has. He was a key part of the fundraising drive to raise money to restore this historic cathedral behind me. Talking to people today, they say his impact was real, lasting, and a testament to the man. A small but poignant tribute to a man particularly important to the people in Ely, the Duke of Edinburgh supported the fundraising for the city's most iconic landmark. He visited this cathedral several times, most recently in 2009. The current dean met him before taking up the role. I was introduced to uh, Duke of Edinburgh as the next dean of Ely and he immediately smiled and beamed and said oh he had a wonderful time here and he particularly remembered um, the great dinner they had in the nave um, to round off the fundraising for that restoration appeal and he spoke memorably of that. Prince Philip took the role of patron of that fundraising organisation that raised millions to restore this place. I'm sure it made a big difference um, and he was actively involved and clearly interested so I'm sure that he then spoke to other people about it and word of mouth and got people interested because he was interested. Today at a time of national reflection people in Ely paid their own tributes. Prince Philip was one of a kind and I have to say, I thought he'd live forever. Uh, he had a real zest for living. Peel for the Queen, and it's a bit sad that he didn't manage 100. I know he would love to have done that. No, very, very sad, to be honest, and they're going to miss him because he was like the rocker of the family, to be honest, and uh, which kept them all together. At Peterborough Cathedral tonight, a bell tolled 99 times to mark 99 years of life. People in the city are able to visit the cathedral to pay respects, but ask not to bring floral tributes. Back in Ely, the cathedral will open especially tomorrow for private prayer to pay tribute to a man whose support has a lasting impact here. Well, this place open tomorrow for private prayer between 10 and 2, and that's despite the fact that general visiting not allowed at the moment because of COVID. The pandemic also means there can be no physical book of condolence put inside the cathedral, but the cathedral will open an online book of condolence tomorrow. Details will also be announced in the coming days of a special service. People here determined to mark the life of an extraordinary man, despite the conditions we currently live in. Sam, thank you. Well, born into the Royal House of Greece and Denmark, Prince Philip became Duke of Edinburgh upon his marriage to the then Princess Elizabeth in 1947. So began a life of public service, crisscrossing the globe, supporting the Queen and, of course, injecting his own inimitable style to royal visits. With a look back on his visits to this region, here's Stuart Ratcliffe. The Duke of Edinburgh finds time during his busy programme to visit Harlow Newtown and to chat with workers who live on the brand new estate. A visit by the Duke of Edinburgh to Harlow in 1952. One of hundreds he made to towns and cities in our region over the years. The Duke was at Cambridge University in his capacity as Chancellor. He had his own unique style, always keen to lighten the mood, here joking with an onlooker about a lens cap. If he was bored by opening countless buildings and factories, he never showed it. You're about to see the world's most experienced plaque unveiler. <laughs> the world's most experienced plaque unveiler, after the Queen perhaps, would often make people laugh. 
And this is nearly to declare that the place is a bit more open than it was before. <laughs> He would have a word for everyone, and not just the bigwigs. This, a visit to the Luton and Dunstable Hospital in 2013. Always inquiring, always interested. His visit to Cambridgeshire was a picture editor's dream, when the Queen and Duke made national headlines as they took a ride on the guided bus. Not the Duke's usual form of transport, but one which he seemed to enjoy anyway. The Duke was also patron or honorary member of several clubs and charities across this region and took an active interest in them all. The Duke was also interviewed on Look East on a number of occasions. In 1991, he talked to Stuart White at his beloved Sandringham about farming and the environment. A great many uh, people in the agricultural industry, put it that way, who were also interested in the conservation of nature. Prince Philip was at Sandringham when he was taken ill in 2011. He later had a heart operation at Patworth Hospital. In 2017, he retired from official duties, spending much of his time on the royal estate in Norfolk, where he could relax. When the Duke had a car accident at Sandringham, he was then prompted to give up driving. But he will be best remembered as a consort to the Queen, a visit to Kings Lynn Fire Station was typical. Where she went, he went, always by her side. Stuart Radcliffe, BBC Look East. Well, the royal family's connections to this region are, of course, rooted at Sandringham, the Queen's private residence in Norfolk. It was there the Duke turned to when he stepped back from public life in 2017, choosing the quiet seclusion of the estate over the hurly-burly of London, as Ian Barmer now reports. In this corner of West Norfolk, the Duke's death will be keenly felt. He loved the Sandringham estate and took a hands-on role in running it. He loved shooting and driving his carriage around the private lanes. Sandringham isn't a royal palace, it's a private house. And for the royal family, a place where they can live more informally, away from the spotlight. Christmas was always spent with the family in the main house. But at other times, the Duke would live in his private home on the Sandringham estate, Wood Farm at Wolferton. He loved Sandringham, as we all know, with an absolute passion. He knew intimately almost every blade of grass. Such was his deep, deep affection for, for Norfolk as a whole, but for Sandringham and for the little villages, um, communities around that place in that very special pocket of West Norfolk, um, which he held in such deep affection. And in return, of course, they held him in deep, deep affection. In Norfolk, the Duke loved the freedom to drive his own car, and it was during one of those stays at Sandringham in 2019 that he crashed his Land Rover. It overturned in a collision with another car, but the then 97-year-old was unhurt. Two other women needed hospital treatment, and it prompted Prince Philip to hand in his driving licence. By this time, though, he was already retired from public life after nearly 70 years of service and would live at Wood Farm for several months at a time. To the end, Sandringham was a huge part of his life. Ian Barmer, BBC Look East. Well, let's stay at Sandringham, a focal point for well-wishers today wanting to pay their respects. Ben Schofield is there for us now. And Ben, we would expect crowds, but a more serene, sombre note being played out this evening. Yeah, I think that's uh, fair to say, Mo. And while the world pays tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh, the New York Times, for example, calling him the first gentleman in the land. To people living near here, he was their neighbour. Uh, this was his home where he spent Christmas with his family. As you say, well-wishers have been turning out this afternoon to lay flowers at the Norwich gates just around the corner from where I am now. Uh, local people expressing their pride at the uh, royal connection that uh, uh, this area enjoys, but also that sense of loss as well. Uh, some people travelling from further afield, one lady from Braintree in Essex, uh, another from Whittlesea near Peterborough. One note that I read uh, said simply this, thank you for your service and your forever strength. As a country, we thank you. As a serviceman, I salute you. 
think he was so important. He brought so much change and and just um, the way he taught people how to live their lives, I think was really important. I think, I think a role model to many uh, yeah. men and people across the world. I think it's really sad that he's died. Uh, I know he's a, I know he's 99, but it's almost like I think when anyone um, dies, it's sad. So I love the royal family; they're a big part of Britain, and um, I, it's nice to show the the boys how how great the royal family are. Um, and coming down here, showing them the the gates, the flowers, it it, it, it all goes down to them, and to show the younger generation. He was a great ambassador for the country. Um, he, I also feel that he was um, for the for the family and and the respect uh, that all of the royal family had for him he was the le a leader even though we've got our queen who is officially the leader but he everyone stood up to him and he was a proud strong man now, because of the uh, risks of COVID-19, Buckingham Palace and the Cabinet Office have both asked the public not to come to royal residence to lay flowers. They're worried about large crowds gathering. The suggestion is that instead of buying flowers, people could uh, pay a small donation to charity in the Duke's memory. Ben, thank you. A reminder that you're watching Look East, a special programme marking the life and charitable work of the Duke of Edinburgh, whose death was announced earlier. We'd love to hear your memories, especially if you have any photos. The details are on the screen now. Maybe you met the Duke on a royal walkabout or perhaps an official visit. Do get in touch, plenty of stories to share, I'm sure. Now, the Duke's first love before he married into the royal family was the sea. He joined the Royal Navy as a teenager in 1939, amassing a clutch of medals for bravery, his career cementing his reputation as an action man hero. That spirit was channelled in later years into his love of sport. So let's join Jonathan Park, who's at Grafham Water and a place John Prince Philip knew well. Yes, very much so, although I don't think the Duke of Edinburgh would enjoy the, uh, the sailing conditions today because it's like a mill pond out there. Very unusual, I have to say. That's about 10 times of the year on Grafham Water. It's just like that. Now, you mentioned sailing. These are the kind of boats, actually, the Flying 15s that the Duke of Edinburgh uh, once would be sailing quite regularly as well. And uh, the trophy I have in my hand, well, he gave this to the Grafham Water Sailing Club back in 1966 as a, as a gift. And every year they now race for it in September and there'll be a new winner, of course, on it this year. And there are so many connections here, so many people have got stories to tell who met Prince Philip and said how he loved sailing. The opening of Grafham Water by His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. 1966 was a famous sporting year, not just for football, but for sailing in Cambridgeshire. The Duke of Edinburgh, well known for his love of the sport, officially opened not just the reservoir, but a sailing club which has gone on to produce Olympic gold medalists. We're all very saddened to hear of his passing. Um, Prince Philip actually opened the sailing club in 1966 when the reservoir was first opened. In fact, as soon as it was announced that they were going to build a reservoir in the early 1960s, a group of keen sailors formed an association, lobbied to get an agreement to open a sailing club here. Um, and Prince Philip actually arrived by motor launch across the reservoir to open our premises ourselves. And he must have enjoyed being here because half a century after his initial visit to open Grafham Water and the sailing club, he was back to celebrate the key milestone. Eric Joyce, who'd been on the water today, remembers meeting someone with a deep knowledge and passion of sailing. He met quite a few of us and some of us had a good long conversation with him and I found him to be a really interested person who was genuinely interested and very knowledgeable about the, the type of sailing that we do here at Grafham. And here are the type of boats that the Duke would sail, called Flying 15s, often alongside its designer and friend, Uffa Fox. Perhaps his greatest achievement was setting up the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme. Millions of youngsters around the world have benefited. Tracy Grant from Cambridge met him several times in her role with the organisation. Uh, Prince Philip was always very personable with the young people. He would make jokes and, and have a laugh with them. He would really relate well to them and the achievements that they've made. Um, I've got a couple of pictures here. Of, uh, these are me at the award presentation, so there's a couple there, which I think you can see. 
meeting Duke of Edinburgh. And then on the final occasion that I met him was when he came to Cambridgeshire in 2016 to Grapham Water Centre. Um, so that was, I don't know if you can see this shiny bit, um, that was the last picture I had taken with the Duke of Edinburgh. Whether it was sailing or carriage driving, the Duke of Edinburgh was a committed sportsman with a keen eye for detail. Remembered fondly by everyone at Grafham Water and whose name will be on this year's trophy. Jonathan Park, BBC Look East. Well, that report's reminding us perhaps of how much the Duke had to give up once the Queen ascended the throne. A good place perhaps to bring in the historian Sean Lang. And Sean, the Duke's life was one defined by his marriage, something I suspect men of that time weren't used to acting as a consort. That's very true, and there weren't many um, precedents, although there's one very big one in Britain, uh, which is, of course, Prince Albert, uh, Queen Victoria's husband, um, but not an easy precedent in a sense, because uh, you know Prince Philip was never given the title of Prince Consort, which uh, Prince Albert had. And in a sense, the British constitution had to work out and almost invent a role for the husband of a reigning queen. Um, and uh, I think in many ways, his whole life was one of trying to sort out exactly what his role was, what his what his function was uh, within the monarchy or indeed within monarchy more generally, because of course he came from European monarchy himself, though exiled uh, as a result of the sort of revolutions that had taken place in a number of European countries at the end of the First World War. So yes, you're quite right, Mo, that um, it, it's, it's not an easy role, it's not an easy position, not much to guide um, even down to, I suppose, you know, the, the argument that there was over the, the surname that should be given to their children, whether it should be Windsor, which was, of course, the, the, the title of the royal family, rather than the normal thing of, of them bearing their, their father's name. So and he wasn't a traditional royal, was he? Because he was a moderniser. He was the one who, who brought the TV cameras in. Yes, absolutely, 1969, um, for that famous royal family film. And uh, I suppose because we've seen um, other sort of modernising figures in, in recent years, it's easy to forget that back in the, in the 1950s, he was the one who was much more informal in his approach. He was the one who was trying to sort of shake things up a little bit. It's easy to forget just how... I'll use the word stuffy because it's been used by others, that the monarchy could appear to people back in those days. And there were huge changes that were brought in, um, and many of them were very much uh, at his urging, what his suggestion, to try to make the monarchy, as I say, trying to find a new role for it in a television age. Um, and, his uh, gaffes, sorry to interrupt. Just, just talking about the modern age, um, those gaffes, um, did he play up to the TV cameras? Yes, I think he did. Um, I mean, just, we, we call them gaffes. I mean, you, to some extent, this is a generational thing because the sort of uh, he, he was making the sort of jokey banter, which was very common among people of of, of his generation, but to, which to us nowadays um, does seem you know very uh, very difficult or problematic, as the word is. But there's no question. I think uh, yes, he, he he was savvy enough. I think if you're in the royal family, it's very difficult not to be savvy enough to know what would get attention, what uh, what the news would would uh, latch on to, and it became part of his persona. Um, and uh, so, yes, I think you're quite right. There, there was a certain amount of playing up for that, and um, and to some extent, I think sometimes he was a bit caught out by it. And he came up with this wonderful phrase to describe himself. Uh, he suffered, as he said, from uh, was it dentopodology, by which he meant opening your mouth and putting your foot in it. Well, Sean Lang, many thanks for your insights. Appreciate it. Let's return to Sandringham now and our political correspondent, Ben Schofield. And Ben, amidst all this, there is a pandemic, there are elections and campaigning, I suspect, has had to stop. Yes, uh, this morning, Mo started as many other days have on the local election campaign trail. So Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, uh, out and about on the campaign and making a stop in Bedford, where he was stumping for his pick for the Police and Crime Commissioner elections. But as news about the Duke of Edinburgh filtered through, campaigning was suspended, as it was uh, for all the major political parties today. Not a day to canvass for votes, but to pay tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh. Well, the UK has lost an extraordinary public servant in Prince Philip. He dedicated his life to our country. And above all, I think he'll be remembered for his support and devotion to the Queen. 
and all of our thoughts are with the Queen, the royal family and the British public as they come together to mourn this huge loss. Of course, our local politicians have also been paying their respects as well. Bim Afalami, the Conservative MP for Hitchin and Harpenden, uh, said this on Twitter, terribly sad news, what a fine public servant. Deepest condolences to the Queen and the whole royal family. Uh, meanwhile, Andrea Ledsom, the Conservative MP for South Northamptonshire, she, sa she said so very, very sad. He will be incredibly missed to the Queen, she said, will be devastated. And the Liberal Democrat Mayor uh, of uh, Bedford, Dave Hodgson, said our thoughts are with the Queen and the entire royal family on this sad day. The Duke of Edinburgh was the longest serving royal consort in British history and we're flying the Union flag at half-mast at Borough Hall to mark his life and death at the age of 99. Of course, tributes will continue to be paid across our region uh, by politicians and uh, by regular members of the public as well. The Speaker of the House of Commons has uh, announced that he is recalling MPs uh, on Monday, coming back early from their Easter break so that they can pay tribute uh, in the House or, of course, virtually as well. Uh, back to you, Mo, from Sandringham. Ben, thank you. Ben Schofield there. Well, as we heard earlier in the programme, the Duke paid many memorable visits to the region over the years. John Ironmonger has been in Northamptonshire, getting reaction to today's news. In our corner of England, there's still a reverence for the royal family. Rockingham Castle, previously held by the Crown, is now the family home of the Lord Lieutenant, Her Majesty's representative in Northamptonshire, and a regular acquaintance of the Duke of Edinburgh. We were at a uh, fundraising event at the Queen's Gallery, and I think it was probably a week or so before, he, maybe it was in the last week that he was in public service, and it was extraordinary. He worked the room, he spoke to everybody in the room, he had a twinkle in his eye, he was really sharp, really engaged, and you, you, you just, there was a question in one's own mind, this person's not ready to retire at this stage, but I think probably he'd realised that he, he, was, he needed a break. <laughs> And it's that sparkle, isn't it, that I think um, so many people are fond of. Do you think that he'll be missed here in Northamptonshire and, and around the country? I think he'll be greatly missed. And I think that, that anyone who's been in, uh, come into, had the fortune of coming into contact with him will certainly um, have very fond memories uh, of, of those occasions. All of us in Northamptonshire uh, send enormous sympathies to the royal family as they mourn the loss of uh, Prince Philip, who has given so much service. Many people felt a connection with Prince Philip during his long life of service, and in Oundle today, he was held affectionately by almost everyone. I suppose if you re reflect, he did look very ill when he came out of hospital last time, but I thought he'd make a hundred, to be honest. He's the sort who would get up, they say, you haven't got much chance, he'd say, I'll down, we'll show you I have. He was well liked, wasn't he? He was, yeah, very well liked. I think I liked his outspokenness, you know, knocked the establishment a bit. And also the press, who can, they must get on their nerves, the press, to be honest. Yeah. And people like yourself in the meat. <laughs> I won't take any offence. <laughs> I feel very sad for the Queen. They've been together a long time. He was a tremendous character. I was thinking the Duke of Edinburgh, because, you know, all, my, all our grandchildren have done that. And, you know, he's left a, he's left a good legacy. I did drive for the royal family, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah. I drove him once, you know, that's all, but um, I was with the Gloucesters. Wow, uh, because yeah. of course he used to want to drive himself, didn't he? That's right, he used to. He used to love to drive himself. Yeah. And did you chat away to him? Yeah, we did at one time because he said, what are you going to do? Because we had about six weeks holiday. And he said, um, what are you going to do on your holiday? I said, well, I work at Marble Picnic Park. I said, I'm going to walk round picking up litter and cleaning the toilets. He said, that must be wonderful. He said, I'd love to do something like that. <laughs> the Duke of Edinburgh once met, never forgotten. Time now for the weather. Julie Ranger has the details. I thought I'd start with this photograph of the sun rising on what has turned out to be a very significant day. As expected, we've had this cold front pushing down from the north. It's dragged its heels a bit and it's set to come to a grinding halt over the top of us later tonight. So 
Many of us will eventually become largely dry apart from an odd shower. We may even see some clear spells developing. I think the thicker cloud and outbreaks of rain will continue over parts of Suffolk and Essex right the way through until morning. But as I said, for many of us, it will eventually become dry. And where we get the breaks in the cloud is where we're going to see those lowest temperatures down close to freezing. And that's where we're also likely to see a bit of frost too, especially with those light winds. And then tomorrow, still a lot of uncertainty how far north this weather front is going to push some rain. So this is what the computer thinks at the moment. The further north and northwest you are, the more likely you are to have a day which could produce some brightness and even sunshine and just a few showers. Elsewhere, more in the way of cloud with some showers and perhaps even some longer spells of rain. And wherever you are, it is going to be bitterly cold. We see the return of that air feeding all the way down from the Arctic. Highs of only about six to nine degrees Celsius and feeling even colder still in that north to northeasterly wind, gusting 25 to 35 miles per hour. On Sunday, we keep that cold flow of air, but I do think we should see some decent spells of sunshine, but also some showers, and they could be of rain, sleet, or snow. And again, we'll have temperatures below average for the time of year, which is about 12 degrees Celsius, and those winds making it feel all the colder. But as we head into next week, I think a change in wind direction. They'll become more southerly and we'll see temperatures by day coming back closer to average. Monday, the chance of a bit of showery rain, but next week it does look like high pressure will bring us a lot of fine and dry weather. And in that sunshine, it should feel fairly pleasant with mainly light winds and highs eventually of around 13 or 14 degrees Celsius. As for your overnight lows, we've still got some cold and frosty nights on the way. Sunday night, we could now see perhaps in some spots temperatures as low as minus five but as we head towards the end of the week those overnight those coming up a little bit we may become frost free four celsius is about average for this time of year and that's your forecast bye bye well that is all from bbc look east coming up next a special documentary looking back at the duke of edinburgh's life but we end tonight with some enduring images from the past 77 years from everyone here. Goodbye.